welcome to the 2021 NAFEX conference. This is our Zoom conference, our virtual conference for this year. I want to welcome everyone. And I am Chris Heater. I'm the NAFEX president currently. And I want to thank everyone who has made this conference possible. We have um, a wonderful board and a number of speakers who have volunteered their time to bring this conference to you this year. We have 12 sessions planned, 24 speakers. It's going to be amazing. Um, and the beauty of this is that you can attend both live and you can also view the recordings um, later if you'd like. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to our first facilitator, Eric Bina, who will introduce the first session, Getting Started in Fruit Growing Tips from the Field. Take it away, Eric. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Eric Bina, and I'm a volunteer here at NAFEX. Um, and that's short for North American Fruit Explorer, sorry. And this session is Getting Started in Fruit Growing. Uh, before I introduce today's panel, a few housekeeping items. So it turns out this is a webinar format, not your typical Zoom meeting format. So participants' audio and video features will be automatically disabled. We encourage you to ask questions, use the Q&A tab. Um, we will have technical questions and topical questions answered throughout, and we'll answer questions for the panelists at the end. If you're new to Zoom, you can adjust your screen and view some of your Zoom settings on your device. Um, finally, a little bit about NAFEX. Um, NAFEX is, was founded in 1967. Uh, the North American Food Explorers is a network of individuals throughout the United States and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruits and nuts. Um, NAFEX members share ideas, information, experiences, and fruit propagating material via our website, social media channels, fruit specific interest group meetings, and annual conferences like this one. As a paid NAFEX member, you get four editions of the Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search 50 years worth of Pomona's in our digital library. This organization exists because of fruit growing members like you, and we encourage you to continue your membership and become actively involved as an interest group member, committee member, or board member. Please visit our website to learn more at nafex.org. And now let me introduce our panel members. Today's panel will have Susan Poisoner of Orchard People Fruit Tree Care, Larry Stevenson of Southern Cultured, Cultured Orchards and Nursery, and Sam Hubert of One Green World Nursery. So to get us started, let me introduce Susan Poisoner, the founder of Orchard People Fruit Tree Care Consulting and Education. She's a journalist, filmmaker, urban orchardist, and host of the Orchard People podcast. In 2009, she co-founded the Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard in Toronto. She planted trees with lots of hope and optimism, but it didn't take long before the problem started. In researching solutions, she developed a simple way to grow organic fruit trees that would help her care for and protect the trees in the park. She went on to author, author the award-winning fruit tree care book, Growing Urban Orchards, and to train thousands of people in Canada, the US, and abroad with her online courses at learn.orchardpeople.com. Susan also teaches in-person workshops and live webinars and provides fruit tree care articles and videos online at her website, orchardpeople.com. So Susan, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Eric. It is really lovely to be here. So uh, let's talk about growing fruit trees. I'm going to share my screen now. And here we go. Let's see what we get. Oh, share. And then I'm going to do this. Can everybody see my slideshow? I hope so. I'm going to assume that's a yes. Yeah, I, I saw a nod. Thank you very much, Larry. Okay, so let's talk about how to be successful as a beginner grower. Um, thank you. Eric mentioned that I started Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard here in Toronto. And I, um, my background is a journalist and a filmmaker, um, not a lot to do with fruit trees, actually, but I was an organic gardener when I started the orchard, and this is in 2009. And I thought it was going to be easy, actually. Oh, my gosh, I really did. And I'm so embarrassed about that now. I thought it was just about planting some fruit trees in the ground and just leaving them there, watering them a little bit, and then you get all sorts of free organic fruit that's perfect and yummy and delicious. 
Well, I wonder how many of you guys are saying, oh my gosh, did she really think that? Because there are lots of challenges. But what happened was I stumbled a lot in the first hmm, three to five years. And also there was a lot of pressure on me to get it right. Because in my community, there was a little bit of an uprising. I planted my orchard in a public park and people didn't, some, a very small vocal contingent did not want it there. They thought the orchard was going to be messy, it was going to attract pests, it would be a big mess. And so I had to get everything perfect. I had to use all my research skills to make sure that I knew what I was doing. The result ended up being my book, Growing Urban Orchards, which I published in 2014. And I talk about the crazy story that we had starting the orchard, the challenges that we encountered, and the easy solutions I found to a lot of the problems. It's just so much about fruit fruit trees is just, it's it's frightening. There seems like there's so much to, to learn. But once you know what to do, it's not rocket science. And I wrote about that in my book, I talk about it. And then over time, people asked me to teach their groups. Can you teach us how you started the Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard? We want to uh, have a community orchard in our community. So I started to teach. That led to me doing podcasts because I had been a broadcaster anyway. Uh, I've got lots of articles on my website, orchardpeople.com, and I teach online. And then it was absolutely crazy when Niagara College in Ontario called me up and said, could you teach us fruit tree care? The irony is that Niagara is the fruit tree growing region in Ontario, and I paid lots of money to bring people in from Niagara to teach me and my group. So it was kind of a wonderful full circle. But let's talk about what you want when you grow fruit trees. So you want your fruit tree to look healthy, you want it to have lots of fruit on it, and to be productive. And you want the fruit to look yummy and tasty and to be perfect. Am I right? I think so. Maybe I don't can't see the chat, but put a thumbs up if that's what you're looking for. Now here's what we don't want when we grow fruit trees. We do not want weak trees that are with breaking branches and a sad looking harvest of fruit that is hard and doesn't really taste very good. Here's what else we don't want. We don't want wormy, yucky apples and we don't want insects in our fruit. So how do we get from this point where you've got your aspiration to have fabulous fruit trees, healthy fruit trees and delicious fruit and to skip over the part where you've got unhealthy trees and unhappy trees. Well, let's keep going to see what we're going to talk about. I think I have about 10, 15 minutes, so I will go through quickly. But I just want you to know that I put a resource page, both the slideshow and a resource page with lots of links to my website with in-depth articles to a lot of these topics. So I'm going to cover them briefly, but we can go into more detail, or you can when you download the printout. Okay, so what are we going to talk about super quickly? We will talk about choosing the right trees. We will talk about irrigation, what you feed your trees. I know Larry's going to go into a little more detail, I think, later. We'll talk about pruning, thinning, scouting, and learning, which is something I keep doing more and more of all the time. Okay, let's dive in. So one of the biggest and the biggest mistakes I made was right at the beginning, choosing the wrong trees. I, like many other people, you you are familiar with the fruit from the supermarket. So you think, hey, um, I'll get Macintosh apple trees. I'll plant those with Bartlett pears, you know, all the stuff you're familiar with. Not even thinking, are those trees good for my climate zone, for instance? So one of the things you'll need to consider as a new grower is what trees will thrive in your unique zone, in your unique climate and conditions. So if you're in zone five, you want a tree that's going to be hardy to zone five. So that means your tree, if you find a tree that says it's hardy to zone six or seven or zone eight, if you plant that in your backyard or in your orchard, it won't survive the winter. But if you find a tree that you really like that's good for zone four, grab it, go for it. So that's a good option for you. 
So consider the climate zone. The other thing you want to consider is, I call them easier to grow fruit trees. One of the challenges you will have as a fruit tree grower are, are the many, many fruit tree diseases. Now, I'm happy to inform you that each type of fruit only has a limited number of diseases that it gets. There's not unlimited diseases that each fruit tree will encounter. Um, it's good to know what they are ahead of time. And it's good to know what diseases are challenges in your community. So if you know fire blight is a problem in your community, you can order a disease resistant apple tree that is resistant to fire blight. There is no one, not necessarily one magical apple tree that is resistant to all diseases, though there are a few. Freedom apple is a really good one. Maybe we'll hear more about that later from Sam. Um, but um, disease resistant trees make your life a lot easier. So these aren't cultivars that will be well known to you as a, as a person who's new as a grower, but they are definitely worth looking into. And a lot of them have fabulous tasting fruit. Other considerations, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, are uh, pollination requirements. That's something I encounter all the time where people say to me, I've had a plum tree. I planted it seven years ago. I can't figure out why I haven't had fruit yet. And it's like, well, you could keep waiting a long, long time and you still won't get fruit if it is a cross pollinating tree that needs a partner. So some fruit trees need partner trees in order to produce a harvest. Other trees are self-pollinating and one is enough. One tree will be enough if you've got lots of peach trees, apricot trees, some sour cherry trees. There's lots of self-pollinating trees too. So you've got to do your research. And um, that is the most important key to success as a new grower. Research and choose your trees very, very carefully. Okay, let's fly through. Correct irrigation, another mistake I have made. Um, so when we got our fruit trees, uh, we didn't have water in the park. And so I raised a bunch of money to put in an irrigation system. And that's fantastic. The only problem is it's a sprinkler system and it sprinkles the entire tree. So not only is that a waste of water, because you really need to focus like uh, Alex in the background is watering a tree. He is focusing on watering the roots of the tree. He's not watering the canopy of the tree. He's not watering the grass around the tree. He's watering the roots, which is where the, 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 the tree takes in water and nutrition. So, but not only are sprinkler systems a waste of water, all that moisture in the tree's canopy can lead to an increase of fungal diseases. If the canopy is wet and stays wet and damp and moist all the time, you're actually making problems for yourself. So correct irrigation, great idea. Don't make the mistake I made. You can avoid sprinklers. You can use soaker hoses. There are fantastic drip systems to look into. And the place you want to focus your tree on is under the drip line. So that's under the outer edge of the canopy. So in the foreground of the picture, you see my husband Cliff with my neighbor Sherry, and they're sort of thoughtfully looking at an apricot tree, I think it is. And you see how um, the, the mulch stretches out to the edge of the canopy. That is where the feeder roots are. That is where the roots are that take in the water. So that's where you need to focus. So, just to uh, remind you, um, soaker hoses are great. You will set them up at the edge of the canopy. This is from my book. It was a really fun idea that I heard about. If you've only got one tree and you're you know, in the garden with a hose, you can have buckets and drill holes into the bottom so that they slowly, slowly let the water out and put the buckets around the drip line of the tree, fill them up, move them around, um, while you go weeding somewhere. And, and again, it's a slow, deep watering for your tree. Allow it to be watered deeply and then let it dry out for a couple of days and you'll water again, especially for young trees that need to be established. Okay, let's talk about, checking my time, let's talk about feeding your trees. 
Oh my goodness. Easiest way to feed a fruit tree and probably in some ways the best is in the spring before that tree is going on a marathon. It's going to be pushing out leaves. It's going to be pushing out flowers. It's eventually going to be forming fruit. Um, It's going to be very busy and it needs support. In the early spring, it's relying on nutrition that is stored in its root system. Um, So it's going to first use that nutrition in the pantry, which is the root system. It's going to push that, pull that up into the tree and use it to power growth. But after that, it's going to be tired and, and it needs some nourishment. So during the early spring, you want to lay out compost or well rotted manure around your tree's like under the canopy. Again, it's like a donut shape. You can kind of see it here. This tree needs a little more mulch. I would take it out a little further to the edge of the canopy. I would remove the grass to the edge of the canopy so the grass is not competing with uh, the tree. Sorry, not competing with the tree for the nutrition and water. So here's the thing to beware of. Fruit tree spikes. You can go online, you can find lots of them, you pop them in the ground, they promise you you're going to have fabulous fruit. They don't know what your soil is like. So how can they know what nutrients you need in your soil? And it's the same thing, you go online, some some bloggers will say use 10, 10, 10 once a year, or use this, use that. How do they know what your soil needs? Your soil is unique. And so in my training that I do with people, I always get them to start off with the soil test. Now you could say, what's the harm if I add a little extra, you know, nourishment here, nourishment there, a little NPK, what's the harm? Well, we know about pollution and we know that fertilizers do cause pollution, but, but even more added to that, it can hurt, it can harm your tree. It can make it grow too fast. It can um, cause problems with the health of your tree. So even if you don't care about the environment, and I know all of us do, if you want a healthy and productive tree, you need to know what nutrients are in the soil. You don't have to test your your soil every year, but in the beginning, you want to find out what your soil is like and correct it as necessary. And, And I think Larry's going to talk about that a little bit later. So we talked about the drip line, the edge of the canopy, And in this picture, there is grass, shame, shame, shame. There is grass over the drip line. So in my orchard, we have time, we have volunteers, we remove all the grass and uh, we make sure that there's good quality, nutritious mulch there. We would make sure that's where we are watering as well. Pruning, I will quickly tell you that it is important. Um, We do it annually from the very day that we plant our bare root tree. Um, we, we start pruning the tree. I see it sort of like a sculpture, like, you know, it's clay. We are forming a beautiful, strong fruit bearing structure for our tree. We are ensuring that every branch has equal access to sunshine so that that fruit will ripen properly. So, and then the other thing we want to make sure is that we are improving air circulation. The more crowded the canopy is, the more likely you are to have pest and disease problems. Again, disease loves moist, damp conditions, and pests are the same. They will love it if you don't prune your tree and you have a big mess of branches. Let's have a look here at a comparison. So this tree on the left, I don't think has ever been pruned. And you can see the amount of branches. And once that leaves out, it's going to be very crowded. The air circulation in there will not be good. And so that can cause health problems. And will every branch has have access to sun? I don't think so. The tree on the right is nicely pruned. It's a beautiful old tree. And you can see that you can actually throw a football through this tree and it'll get to the other side. So you want to make sure you prune your tree properly. This is a skill that you'll need to learn. It is not rocket science. I teach it. Lots of people teach it. It's fruit tree pruning. It has nothing to do with pruning native and ornamental trees. That's a different type of pruning. It's its own thing. Thinning and back to this sad little tree. Oh my goodness. Um, So thinning fruit is also important. When you plant a young tree, we are so eager to taste the fruit. And I get that. I understand. It's exciting. 
But this is a time for a little bit of self-sacrifice or sacrifice on our part so that our fruit tree has the energy to establish its root systems and to establish itself in the ground. So for the first two years, I don't force my fruit trees to push out fruit and to, to support a fruit a harvest. I remove all the baby fruit in the first year, for sure, um, two years sometimes. After that, I thin the fruit so that the tree and the branch can support it. Now, this tree that we're looking at also has not been pruned. So if it had shorter branches, those branches wouldn't be so close to breaking. It would be in better shape. And then finally, when you're thinning the fruit, you want to keep in mind, how big do you want that fruit to be? Apricots can be so, you know, they can cover your tree and you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to get a great harvest. But think how big they grow when they're mature and ripe and delicious and think they're not going to have room for that. Another reason you need to thin. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast, guys, but there's some amazing people coming up. So uh, we will go on. When you're thinning apples, I'd be curious to hear what the other panelists do. Uh, if you have a cluster of five apples or something, I'm pretty harsh. I thin it down to maybe two. Um, so you're pulling off these cute little fruitlets. And that way, every apple has room to grow big and that they will have the energy to uh, be sweet and delicious and ripe and whatever. Finally, scouting is something that is actually kind of fun once you learn how to do it. You got to keep an eye on your trees, just like I'm sure people keep a good eye on their kids to see what they're up to, right? You want to make sure and check in and make sure they're healthy and doing well. But in order to do that, you need to know a little bit about the pests and diseases that each tree has. And again, no worries. Each tree has a limited number of diseases and pests that it encounters. So you need to learn what they are, and then you know what to look for. And then what you can do is when you see any early signs of pest and disease problems, you can nip them in the bud. Um, something I teach is integrated pest management. These are strategies where by scouting your trees, you can also use less spray. Like you may not have to spray your tree as much. There are many different tools you can use. There are traps, there are organic sprays. You are paying a lot of attention to the soil and making sure your tree is healthy. And also pruning, you could be pruning out disease, you could be using netting and much more. It is easier, guys, to prevent pest and disease problems with fruit trees than to cure them. So what people do, they don't realize they have a healthy tree in the backyard and they think my tree is healthy. I don't have to learn about pests and diseases. But that is actually the time you want to learn about pests and diseases because your tree is healthy. And so you can catch them when inevitably they're going to come along. Something I say about fruit trees is they're like kids in kindergarten. They will catch every single thing that is going around in terms of fruit tree diseases. So you want to make sure that you protect your little trees before they get into trouble. Okay, so that was a pretty whirlwind tour. I hope that wasn't too fast or too slow. Um, I put a document online. I have loads of resources at orchardpeople.com. So I picked out a few articles, some podcasts, all sorts of stuff, and I put it in a resources download that you guys can have access to um, in my file. Uh, Leslie mentioned, that, um, well, well, Leslie or somebody will tell you about that. Maybe Eric is going to tell you about that. Uh, so enjoy it. And then finally, I think that's it for me for now. I have a book, Growing Urban Orchards. I teach fruit tree care training online at orchardpeople.com. And I have a podcast, which is a lot of fun that you can listen to where we talk about all this stuff. So I think what I'm going to do is unshare my screen. Let's see how that works. And that's it for now, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. That was fantastic. And uh, we're gonna hold questions for Susan until the end for the question and answer period. So now we will move much further south down to Mississippi and Larry Stevenson. He's the founder of Southern Cultured Orchards and Nursery. After decades of fruit growing at the hobby, Larry finally got the nerve to try it as a full-time business. 
And today, Larry operates Southern Cultured Orchards and Nursery based in Carrollton, Mississippi, where he propagates, grows, and distributes heirloom native and exotic fruit trees. Larry is the director of the North American Fruit Explorers. His business motto is yesterday's trees planted today for tomorrow's generations. I understand Larry has a, a rural internet connection, so hopefully this works out. Larry, the floor is yours. Good to be here. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I think my little speech will follow Susan's very well, because I'll talk a little bit about soil and preparing your soil. A few things you can consider before you begin. Number one, a little planning goes a long way. Lay your, if you're starting a new orchard, lay your orchard out in straight rows. You may think now that you'll never need to move heavy equipment between them or ever put in irrigation lines, but you probably will. And if you lay a bunch of trees out in a random pattern and then decide to stretch your irrigation lines between them, uh, you'll find out the reason why they should be in straight rows. Plants need sunlight, water, and soil. That's very basic. We think we all know that, but uh, always remind yourself they need those three things. Most fruit trees can survive with half a day of sun, but to really thrive and fruit well, they need at least three quarter or full sun. Not much will fruit well in the shade, even pawpaws. Mature pawpaws need full sun if they can get it. Most all fruit trees need drainage for the roots. That's why you see orchards on hillsides so much. Very few will thrive in a persistently wet spot. Something like native persimmon or mulberry are pretty tough. They live a lot of places, but nothing's gonna like a bog, boggy spot all the time. I do not add amendments to the planting hole. Sooner or later, your roots will have to adapt to your native soil uh, no matter how rich or poor your soil is. If you add a lot of rich potting soil to the planting hole, you, you sort of spoil the roots. The, the roots will want to stay there and not venture out, and the tree effectively gets pot bound. The roots want to stay right there around that rich soil, and they'll eventually be stunted. Uh, whatever soil you have, that's the soil you, you got. You probably can't buy a new orchard land just to lay out fruit trees, so your trees have to adapt to your native soil. The first useful step you can take in a new orchard is to get a soil test. The easiest way to do that is through your state extension service. They do it all the time. Uh, go, there's uh, usually a county, uh, an office in every county. Uh, go there, they'll give you a cardboard box for a sample and a form to fill out. You mark home orchard on there. To get your samples uh, to send them, uh, dig a number of deep holes all through your site, below the side, below the grass. Take a tablespoon or two of dirt from each soil, uh, put them in a clean plastic bowl and let it dry and mix those all together. Because you want an average sample of the entire site, not just one spot, the, 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 they can vary. You know, if you got uh, one, uh, well, you've got one tree planted, uh, the soil, the nutrients in there, and the pH can vary a little bit from something 100 yards away. You don't care. You, you just want an average of your whole orchard. Let those dry out. Uh, put them in a sample box and mail it to the extension service lab. Don't send them a, a box of mud and grass roots. They don't like that. Uh, but they'll send, they usually send them back pretty fast. They usually send the results by emails now. And they'll send you a complete mineral analysis with recommendations on what amendments to make. Uh, what If you're low or high on magnesium, zinc, boron, whatever, they will tell you. I think the most useful information you can get from a soil test is a pH level of your soil. And pH, I think, is probably the first thing you should address for a new orchard. The, the pH is a measure of, of how acid or how alkaline your soil is. The pH scale runs from one to 14. On the scale, one is very, very acid, seven is neutral, and 14 is very alkaline. Most plants will prefer a neutral or slightly acidic soil to really thrive. A pH level of from 6.0 to 7.0 is ideal, and that is something you should work for. Most of us in this area, the southeastern US states, have pretty acidic soils. My native soil pH is 5.3, so 
So I correct that with lime, calcium carbonate. My buddy Stacy Russell up in Fulton, Mississippi, has a collection of over 600 apple trees. He's, that's his personal collection. He's still planting. The first time I visited his orchard, I was amazed at the size of his apple leaves. They were huge. They looked big as cottonwood leaves. Uh, my apple trees don't look like that. The reason why, of course, is that he has long ago corrected the pH of his soil by adding lime, and he adds more every year. Uh, you can see the difference in the, his, the size and health of his trees and the leaves on them. We think it takes about 30 or 40 leaves to support the growth of one fruit, so the size and number of healthy leaves does matter. That affects your fruit crop. If your pH level is too low, at too low a level, the chemical reaction whereby roots absorb nutrients cannot be efficient. I mean, physically, chemically, uh, that reaction can't occur 100% if the pH is too low. At a soil pH level of uh, 5.0, for example, only about 35% of available soil nutrients can be used. If you go up to a level of 6.0, about 75% of those nutrients can be used. It's only at a pH level of between 6.5 and 7 can 100% of soil nutrients be fully utilized. Uh, so both the added fertilizers that you're giving the tree and the normally occurring nutrients are wasted unless the pH level allows these chemical reactions to occur. That's soil is corrected by adding lime, calcium carbonate, Lime comes in several forms. Uh, it's available to us all through feed, feed stores and local co-ops. For a real small area, the bags of powdered lime at bash, and they're easy to apply to a small area. In the spring, at even the big box stores, you'll see bags of pelletized lime, and those are easy to apply with a, real evenly with the seed spreader. For a larger area, and I mean a half acre or more, uh, Lime is applied at a rate of tons per acre. It takes a lot. Uh, and probably the any type of bag lime will be a little bit expensive for you. Ag lime, agricultural lime will be your best choice for a half acre or more, I think. It's about $30 a ton in my area right now. And I put out two tons per acre, so it's a lot. Uh, but you can find that in nearly every farming area. If you go to your county co-op or big feed store, it's that big mountain of gray dirt out behind the store, you know. Uh, they big farmers buy it. They they have they understand that the pH has to be right on their property, so they apply a line every year. Um, they usually load it in the big spreader trailers by the tons. You, you'll buy like ten tons at a time, and I will tell you, it takes a really big farm truck or a pretty good sized tractor to haul those spreader trucks. If you have a smaller pickup, like most of us do, you may have to talk the, the co-op guys into loading it into your truck with a, a backhoe or something, you know, and spreading it out by hand, which is trouble, but it, it's worth it. You know, I put out about eight tons of lime on my property last year by hand, uh, which was a huge amount of manual labor, but uh, I thought it was that important. If you happen to live in an area where there's a lot of naturally occurring limestone and you have naturally alkaline soil, <coughs> you can lower the pH by adding sulfur. <coughs> I haven't had much experience with that. I've lived in acid soil all my life. Plants, it seems to me like plants tolerate alkaline soil maybe a little better than they would a, a low pH acid soil. Uh, places with uh, naturally occurring limestone, which tend to be slightly alkaline, those are big uh, commercial farming areas because plants tend to like uh, slightly alkaline soil. You know, that's where you grow some of your major uh, food crops right there. And they don't have to lime their soil, of course. Lime is slow acting and it takes up to a year to have a full effect. So don't really expect immediate results and plan to add a little bit more every year and do a soil test once a year. Lime will act faster if you till it or disc it into the ground to get better soil, soil contact. But I've just thrown a lot on top of the ground and it seeps in eventually. It's just not fast. 
But I'm convinced that correcting your soil pH is the best thing you can do for the long-term health of your fruit orchard. And that's what we strive for, not short-term actions. You want long-term results. Soil bacteria and fungi will appreciate it too. And with the near neutral pH soil, you'll see a lot more soil activity. That makes for a healthy tree with good nutrient absorption. And a healthy tree like that will be more resistant to pests and diseases naturally by itself. And you just won't have the problem with a tree that's really healthy and liking the site. And those chemical reactions are occurring where it can absorb nutrients. It will naturally be more healthy than the tree that's under stress, you know, and you just, they will naturally resist pests and diseases. A big thing, another big thing besides correcting your soil pH, I guess the next thing after that is adding biological materials to your soil. And that's a topic for another meeting, a, a big thing, I think. Uh, my organic growing friends that add a lot of compost to the soil, I know that they don't seem to have pH problems. Uh, a lot of compost and biological materials somehow seems to kind of neutralize any soil and, and is always going to be to an advantage. So you can't lose by working some mulches and biological materials into your soil. That's about it for me. Okay, Larry, well, that was fascinating. Um, so now we're going to move on to our final speaker, Sam Hubert. Uh, Sam is the nursery manager at One Green World, um, a retail and mail order nursery based in Portland, Oregon, that specializes in fruiting trees, shrubs, and perennial vegetables, and Mediterranean plants from around the globe. One Green World is also the sponsor for this conference, so thank you, One Green World. Um, Sam's interest is primarily in low water, low input perennial plants that are well adapted to the West Coast with focus on figs, olives, pomegranates, and cold hardy citrus. Sam loves experimenting with new varieties that show potential for the home gardener and commercial orchardist on a resilient and increasingly chaotic climate. Aside from growing fruiting plants, he enjoys combining West Coast and Mediterranean shrubs into edible landscape designs to add year-round interest in habitat for pollinators and wildlife. So go ahead, Sam. There we go. Now, now I can be heard. Sorry, I haven't been on Zoom in a while. All right. Thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to, to follow you too. Um, and you all touched a little bit on, on some of what I'll talk about, but uh, varieties, there's, there's endless varieties. And I often think of our nurseries and other ones like us as sort of a, a botanical candy store. Um, only at a normal candy store, maybe they'll like give you a sample um, and, you know, it's very low cost. When you're growing trees and shrubs, it's like, it sometimes costs a lot of time and money and you're not going to know um, what those flavors are for sometimes a long time. Uh, so we try to offer people as much guidance as we can in terms of what we'll do well in their area. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a bit, but uh, always keep in mind where somebody's talking to you from. So whether they're in Toronto or the Southeast, or in my case, the Pacific Northwest, we all have, uh, you know, a bioregional area where we're collecting this data and um, sharing it with you all. And so we know a lot about what does well in our climate. And we're always learning, learning more and collecting new things. But um, yeah, having, having hyper localized resources for all these things, I think makes it all work. Um, so I'll start with like a, a quick story. I was at the Bullock Brothers homestead on Orcas Island. And if anybody's been there, they know that it's sort of this veritable garden of Eden. They've been uh, at this, you know, what Nafex and others are doing for a very long time. And you're walking through and just eating the most delicious fruits you've ever had. Um, more plums than you know what to do with. And we were doing a, a mock design for like a fake client kind of thing. And, and I'm going through these nursery catalogs for, you know, like One Green World and Burnt Ridge and Rolling River and all these folks. And there's just endless varieties that are listed, right? Um, and so I, I come up with my, my little homestead design for, you know, no budget constraints or anything. You kind of get to just choose whatever you'd like. And it's kind of like everything's on there, which you know, to some extent, like, yeah, let's include as much diversity as possible. But um, that process of how we choose what will actually work for our climate, um, I think is a pretty 
a pretty monstrous task and one that uh, we take pretty seriously and that our nursery, NAFEX, California Rare Fruit Growers, all these different organizations are trying to accumulate the right biological material so that we can, um, you know, live the most delicious life possible <laughs> and for many other reasons. Um, so Susan had touched on hardiness zones. Um, I always think of hardiness zones as, uh, will it make it through the winter? Cause you can have a zone eight here in the Northwest and a zone eight in Arizona, and they look like two very different climates. So keep in mind, cause us nurseries often use hardiness zones as a, you know, sort of the, the lowest rung that something has to jump over in order to, to work out. But keep in mind, hardiness zone doesn't necessarily tell you that much about climate, just how cold you can expect it to get. Um, there's other things like frost free days and elevation. We're looking at a project in, in Utah right now where it's a zone five, um, but it's a zone five at 6,000 feet. And so it's got maybe a 60 day growing season or something like that without any frost. Um, and then there's different things like chill hours and heat units. Uh, chill hours are the amount of cooling between 34 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit that you actually need. Most of us in the Northern temperate world don't have to worry about that that much, but um, you start going down South and we have people in California all the time saying, give me a low chill apple or a low chill pear. Um, so if you're in that kind of climate, that's something to really keep in mind. And I often say, well, I don't know. We don't have good data for that because we have enough chill hours for all these things. So again, the hyper localized resources, I think are the best, best bets we have for these kinds of things. Um, disease pressure, Susan touched on, we can grow all sorts of cool peaches, apricots, and nectarines, but I usually try to avoid it because they don't do that well here. You could maybe grow one under your porch, or we certainly try to find the um, genetics, the varieties that are most resistant, but it's, it's the most resistant amongst a group of plants that are incredibly disease prone in your area. Um, and so there's a lot of things that will not be as disease prone. Uh, and then the last thing with, with climate and all that, I, I, I like to focus on is, is microclimate. And this does not work on the farm and orchard scale as much, of course, like South facing hillside versus North facing hillside. There's always different frost pockets and microclimates, um, in, you know, any large rural area, we all know people say, oh, the frost gathers there or not there, or across a certain valley, you can grow certain things where you can't grow them in other places. Um, and, and one thing I've noticed too, like the, the old world European wine growers have done a good job exemplifying this for us, this idea of microclimate. Um, and I've always thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could get all of our fruiting varieties to be this important to us to have this much research put into it um, to the point where we know with such nuance of soil and climate and rainfall and all that, what works well on this side of a valley versus another side of a valley. Um, right now, we're not, we're not quite there with most of the things we grow, but um, I always think that's an interesting snippet for the, the types of data we could collect and um, the way we could approach this if we, you know, if everybody was as on board with how important all these different fruiting crops are. Um, another thing, obviously, is soil and rootstock. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too much to, to get into. I'm not a soil scientist, um, and that's a huge topic unto itself. Um, and Larry did a good job giving us a little overview on all that too, but essentially uh, take all, all Larry's advice in terms of well draining, get your pH between six and seven. Uh, but then with rootstock, there's often many different rootstock choices for you. Um, and this can sometimes be the difference uh, between a variety either thriving or, you know, just limping along in your area. Uh, root stocks tend to be incredibly well adapted, incredibly tough, disease resistant, uh, drought resistant. You'll usually see, um, you know, if a tree dies, what comes back is the root stock because it is far tougher than most fruit and cultivars. Uh, so most people think about disease or, uh, sorry, not disease, but root stocks in terms of how dwarfing they are because that's certainly a big component, especially folks in the urban atmosphere who say, 
I want to grow an apple tree, but it cannot get bigger than six feet tall by three feet wide. And you're like, okay, I hope you like pruning. Um, but there's a lot more to rootstock than just how dwarfing they are. Um, they're usually selected for, you know, tolerance to different soils, resistance to various diseases. Um, vigor is certainly one precociousness. And, uh, this is one where, you know, your local extension agency can often help with that. Uh, but also sometimes you can go across species. Like we have a plant, the Shapova, which is a cross between the mountain ash and the European pear. It's this really unique fruit, really delicious, can sometimes take a while to fruit. Um, but like many of these things in the rose family, they're kind of adaptable to what they're able to be grafted onto. And so we um, had noticed that Northwoods Nursery was grafting Shapova onto uh, Aronia, which is a pretty wet loving thing. Of all, the, of all the fruiting plants we grow, Aronia can really take some wet soils. And we had this rain garden we were working on. And sometimes rain gardens in Portland are just a bunch of carrots and juncus and not that exciting, you know, useful, utilitarian, but not, not producing a lot of edible, delicious fruit. And so we grafted um, Chipova onto this Aronia, which can take some pretty wet roots. And just by having that rootstock variation or variability and adaptability, we were able to grow something there that otherwise we probably wouldn't be able to have um, a fruiting clone. And of course, commercial orchardists and farmers are thinking about this all the time, a huge amount of almost more consideration sometimes goes into rootstock than your actual fruiting cultivar, um, because that's the thing that's interacting with the soil that's, you know, taking up nutrients. It's going to determine how drought tolerant everything is. So don't, don't, uh, don't skimp on your research when, when selecting rootstocks, um, and find one that's really well adapted to your area. And a lot of them are pretty good at being generalists and all that. So they typically work well in a lot of different places, which is why they're used for rootstock. But um, yeah, quick note on, 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 don't forget to choose the right one. Um, but then with a lot of these things, it's, I mean, still the case where you're about to invest all this time and all this energy um, into growing your young orchard. And in our nursery catalogs, you know, like, we try to do a pretty good job describing the differences, but it's hard to make a decision for what variety you're going to choose. Sometimes, you know, because you've been to the grocery store and you say, I love honey crisp apples. That's the best apple in the world. And I'm going to grow an orchard of nothing but that. And it's like, okay, that's cool. But also there's all these other varieties. Um, and it turns out there might be a variety out there that's even better than honey crisp. It might be your favorite variety, or you might have thought that you didn't like a certain fruit. And if you can just find the right variety, um, you might end up loving that fruit. There's certain people who say, oh, I don't love figs. I don't like the jelly texture. And then we find them a fig that's really small, different skin to flesh ratio. And it's kind of a little more chewy and crunchy and they not so like a big ball of jelly in their mouth. And they go, oh, I finally like this fruit now. Um, so it's when thinking about varieties, they can be both the key that sort of unlocks that fruit's ability to be grown in your area, but also can unlock, you know, different flavors and things for people to say like, I actually like that fruit now. Um, so yeah, one, another quick note on that. I often think of varieties as like, you know, if you can find the right variety, the right genetics, be it cold tolerance, disease resistance, ripening time. I mean, you can really unlock um, that, that fruit's ability to be grown in your area. Um, a classic example is the desert king fig, which is this really early ripening fig. It ripes on uh, last year's wood. And so the, the fruits ripen like late July, early August. If it weren't for that variety, most of like the Puget Sound, the really cool parts of Washington State, there's a lot of other varieties they could do. But this one has been the one that like, that's their staple. That's what everybody grows. And if that one wasn't around, people might kind of dismiss the species as a whole which would be a real shame because it's a amazing climate adapted, delicious crop. Um, so I always try to, you know, press the point to people like variety decision. It makes a big deal. Um, be it ripening time, be it flavor and all that. Um, but a few places you can go to sort of test these things out and taste these things. 
um, because it is, like I said, a pretty big commitment to, to just jump into growing this plant, never having no, and I'm always impressed with how people will do this. They'll come and they'll say, I just heard of pineapple guava and I think I might love that. Give me five plants. I'm going to grow this thing. I go, wow, that's, that's very bold and courageous. You don't even know if you like it yet, but it sounds really good, you know? Um, but it's nice to be able to taste these things before you do it. And obviously COVID's kind of throwing a wrench in all our fruit tasting events, but, uh, I encourage folks, there was the home orchard society here in Oregon, California fruit growers does all sorts of stuff. NAFEX, there's smaller groups all around the country, um, who are putting on, and even just like your farmer's market, uh, local orchardists, universities, university extension programs, um, the USDA and various, you know, universities have these test orchards and they want to share with people who are excited about it. Um, so there's tons and tons of resources for finding the varieties, these sort of rare varieties that you're not going to see at the grocery store because they're not shippable. You can't just send them across the country and have a shelf life of, you know, three years or whatever it is now. Um, so finding all these things, uh, all these rare varieties and going out and tasting them, um, because it's really a great way to know what's going to, what you like in your orchard and then talking with local orchardists, what works well for them. They might say, oh yeah, we love, you know, the gauge plums, but they're, they're so shy to produce that we don't produce enough of them. But on the home scale, if you really love that flavor, um, it's something that you can grow. So I always try to encourage people like get out there. There's without a doubt people, at least in your general bioregion who are growing the things you love. Um, and then to couple with the fruit tastings is the, the scion exchanges and, and all these groups that you can get genetic material from people because planting a tree, growing it from scratch, doing what Susan did with like a whole new orchard installation, that's a ton of work. Um, and it, and it costs a bunch of money and, you know, irrigation, this and that, uh, all the labor. Once you already have a tree going, um, the ability to be able to put a new piece of scion on and have it come into fruiting production sooner, uh, being able to try out all these different things in your orchard in a much smaller space for way less cost, um, and way less effort, I think is a incredibly valuable thing. So, um, I guess if you take nothing else from this graft a ton of trees up the ability of the ability to just be able to graft trees together is going to give you, uh, opportunities to try more fruits than you ever could by, you know, having to buy in a new tree every time you want to try that variety or learning how to root your own, your own cuttings and being able to try cuttings that, or try new fruits that way. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess my plug for saying go out there and meet the folks doing the stuff that NAFEX does and support NAFEX and, and, and get a whole bunch of cuttings and you might just find, you know, the variety that is your brand new favorite, or is the thing that unlocks, cold hardy figs for northern ohio or what, <laughs> that might be a stretch but whatever it might be um there's there's ways to to get out there and try this incredible diversity that's out there because i think it's it's a sort of a odd juxtaposition where we have this dwindling biodiversity while at the same time having more access to all these cool fruiting clones all this edible diversity than maybe ever before with, with the internet. And we've certainly lost a lot of variety, but there's just so much out there at our fingertips right now. Um, and so, yeah, get out there and filter through what might work in your area and what definitely doesn't work and take some chances, trying out ones that you think are exciting or were forgotten about. So try all that variety. Hey, Sam, that was fantastic. Um, I now have a question answer period. We definitely have some time for some questions here. So uh, Tim, you've been monitoring that. Can you see what we got? This is from our members. 
And the first one I think that we had posted was from Pat Holland, who asked about how do you filter water? How do you filter toxic fluoridation out of your city water, assuming you're in a city? And then how do you store rainwater in something non-toxic and non-durable? And I guess we could ask that to any of the panelists. Um, I'll, I'll just give a quick answer on part of that. Um, we use city water, so it's too much. We have too many trees to, to do this. But in terms of making holistic sprays, you can actually just put the water in a bucket, leave it outside overnight, and then mix it into your spray so it off gases a little bit. But um, in terms of irrigation, we have to use what we have. What Susan said, I, I used to, when I had just a few trees, you can leave a bucket of water out overnight and the chlorine will evaporate, but I need to water so much now, I have to use city water with chlorine in it. And I don't like it, but and, but uh, the trees are done all right with that, you know, they'll stay in chlorinated water. Yeah, one other quick thing, they make chlorine filters like for garden hoses, and I'm sure there's companies that make bigger ones for putting in line on PVC and things. And I'll try to look it up because one of my friends had one because um, it can mess with soil chemistry and all that, but you can filter it out if you want. Okay, Tim. All right. How about another question? Any suggested resources for researching the details for varieties? Asked Mark Dolan. Well, Sam, you mentioned some resources. Can you go into more detail on that? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think like go if if you if you can find a yeah, there's endless books. There you go. Like <laughs> Larry, Larry <laughs> you need to you need to talk so you show up. Oh, Larry. Okay. Uh, for southern varieties, this is it. Old Southern Apples by Lee Calhoun. And it's out of print. You can buy a digital copy. Of that. that is the only resource for southern apples, south, southeastern apples. There is a new one being written. Uh, Diane Flint from Foggy Ridge Cider is working on now. We hope it'll be out within a year on exclusively southern apples. For other regions, they're, you know, they're all region specific and I know there are lots of books written on uh, northeastern and mid-Atlantic apples, you know, which don't do me any good, but uh, uh, you need one on specific region apples, you know. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I just pick back on, I mean, the localized books, there's tons of things that we know are tried and true workhorses. Um, but I, I think the university extensions, there's often somebody you know, you might be limited because they get, you know, grants only for certain crops. Um, but you'll often find somebody who at least has a pretty good idea um, of what you're doing. I mean, NAFEX is a huge resource. And given all the folks that they have, if you have a particular question like, can I grow such and such in my variety or or what is the best variety? I'm sure there's somebody in, in that group who will know somebody at, at the very least that's had experience trialing that. Sometimes you're the first person that's ever tried that species in your area, but it's a pretty rare thing these days. Um, so sticking with with local folks is usually the best way to do it. And local, if you can find a local nursery who's really growing all their own stuff and trialing it out, and that's a great way to go. Okay, uh, Tim, any more? Yeah, and a reminder plug for the NAFEX website where you can check your membership status and help new members become NAFEX members, nafex.org. And the Pomona, you can read the archives, which has lots of uh, amazing years and years of research we've shared there. So plug for the Pomona. Uh, next question, um, the rootstock options are available in catalogs. Uh, mentions Anna. How do we find more rootstock options? Yeah, yeah. Um... There's some big rootstock nurseries like our, our nursery sells rootstock if you know to the home gardener so you can just buy your own rootstock graft onto it. A lot of these scion exchanges will often sell rootstocks. Um, there's Willamette nurseries um, in in Canby area. A lot of them are based in the Northwest um, where you can find a lot of these things. Um, and 
yeah, that's where that's where I look for them. Susan, how about in Canada? Is there anything special you need to do for Rootstock there? Um, we have in our, oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm not muted. <laughs> okay. We have some nurseries or one nursery in Nova Scotia that sells rootstocks. Not a lot. Um, let's see if like Maple Ridge is the Canadian one that sells rootstocks. If you are going to be grafting your own trees, but our fruit tree <sighs> nurseries do give us some choices. So you can see, um, like most trees, well, they'll have a full size and a dwarfing tree. So you can research, you know, M9, does it have the qualities I need or whatever? So you do get some choice, not a huge amount, though. Okay. Tim, any more? So we have a couple of questions about soil health, since that was uh, well mentioned by a couple of the panelists. Lauren asked, I want to plant blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries. I know blueberries and brambles require far different soil pH levels. Do I need to plant them in completely different locations so the soil amendments don't fight one another? Very good question. Larry, you did the soil amendment stock. What do you think? Uh, blueberries. Blueberries, azaleas, and rhododendrons require acid soil. Uh, they will not be healthy unless you got a low pH. Uh, right over, they need at least under five and a half, and they'll take pH down to four or lower even. Uh, so if, if you do not have pretty naturally occurring acid soil, I would not plant blueberries. You can correct that with sulfur. Uh, I would not bother to. I just grow some more suitable plants, you know. So you need acid soil to grow blueberries. Um, all the bramble berries, I don't grow a whole bunch, but I'm covered up with native blackberries here with a pH of about 5.3, and they sure do thrive. You know, they're, 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 they'll take over the world on native blackberries. So, yes. Uh, something like blueberries that require acid soil, you don't, you'd don't. you be careful how you mix them with other stuff. You would not have blueberries planted around your apple trees or around the base of your pear trees. Just Those just aren't going to mix. Those have a different uh, acid requirement, uh, so pH requirement. Um, brambleberries and blueberries. Uh, brambleberries will take pretty acid soil. Okay. All right. Next question. A uh, specific question Larry answered in the comments, but it was about commercial growers say they use commercial fruit thinners. Are these something home growers should consider? Um, since I was talking about th thinning, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, so I run a community orchard. We have volunteers. And we can just go out. We also prune our trees specifically to keep them somewhat compact so that we can reach all of the branches. So, yeah, I try to avoid chemicals whenever I can. I don't even know if those chemicals are available to home growers. So you just kind of make it an, a family activity and you just take the little baby fruits and you can compost them. I don't know if anybody on the panel does anything with those baby fruits that they thin out. Um, we don't. We just compost them. Okay. Um, Sam, do you know, does it, is that available for home growers or is that just commercial orchards? I've never seen it available for home growers and uh, my understanding of it might be outdated, but I thought that it was like a mild herbicide that did that. And so a lot of home growers might not want to do that. Um, so I think, yeah, on the home scale, I haven't found anything better than good old fashioned fruit thinning and getting up there with a friend and telling stories and thinning fruits. Okay. And uh, I met one guy up, uh, this guy, Pete, who's doing all these cool ferments at, at uh, a homestead one time. And he was using all those baby fruits um, in these weird kind of compost tea things. And we have no data. And I don't know if it did anything, but he was doing it. Okay. We have a few Seven. more questions coming in. Go ahead, Larry. Seven pesticide actually works with thin fruit. Uh, I probably shouldn't even mention it. I would never ever use it myself. And is how you mix the stuff to spray it at the right. Nobody can tell you, but seven is a Jake leg fruit thinner. It would be a bad idea to use it, but I know people try. And, you know, I, I I pick them off by hand. It's not the worst task in the world. I like Sam's idea of telling stories while you do it. That just makes it so much better. Okay. 
So questions coming in, please keep posting them. We have some more questions. Uh, thank you to now Ellen. Ellen asked, I'm new to NAFEX. What is Pomona? I think uh, Larry may be able to answer that or our board president, Chris Heater. But let's go, Larry. Uh, <clears throat> Pomona is our newsletter. Comes out quarterly, every three months. Uh, we encourage all the members to write articles to publish in Pomona. If you have something you want to share, send them to Chris. She's acting as an editor, and we print that out in our own newsletter. Uh, all the members get it digitally. Uh, if you'll pay uh, an extra six bucks, we'll send you a printed copy through the mail, the old-fashioned printed copy, and read it. Um, the NAFEX Facebook page is kind of taking over a lot of the function that Pomona used to serve, but for most of our history, it was the printed newsletter, Pomona, that uh, how we communicated. That's what we used to communicate and share new ideas. And the old Pomonas are, are fantastic reading. You know, that's what got everybody sold. That's why we all joined NAPEX to start. We we gave them a few dollars and they started sending us these newsletters and they were wonderful. You know, before the invention, before Facebook came out, you know, Pomona was it, you know. Uh, and they're on file. We have 50 or 60 years of old Pomona's in file, on file. And if you're a paid up member, you can research those and you just be lost in, in this hole. You can uh, find uh, all kind of fascinating fruit exploring stories by some pretty famous people, fruit explorers and breeders and such. You, uh, it's more, <laughs> you, can, you can spend a few days in the Pomona, old Pomona files. So that's our newsletter. We're proud of it. Right for some. Okay. We have a few more questions, Eric. I uh, will continue until you tell me not to. Yeah, yeah. Um, Pat Holland asked earlier about fluoridation. He, he mentions not chlorine filtration, but I believe uh, fluoridation in the city water can be answered. So I will throw that, but I will ask his follow up question which is also how uh, how do you know if a plant material is GMO genetically altered or if its RNA has been altered? So fluoridation in the water, as well as how do you know your plant material is GMO altered? Hmm. Anyone have any ideas on that? Don't I don't. Know. Go for it, no, Go ahead. I was just going to say, as far as I know, there are very few, um, well, maybe I do just very few genetically modified fruit trees. Is that true? I, I think so. Sam or? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that, that act of like going into the lab and it, it's tricky when we say genetically modified because ever since we've been finding a fruit that we thought was tastier and cloning it, we've been selecting for particular genetics and we're constantly doing that, whether it's, you know, old fashioned plant breeding or um, what they do in the, like with the Roundup Ready corn and all that is they're, you know, putting a different, you know, in this case, like a bacteria into a genome that would never occur in nature. Um, and, and I don't think you have to worry too much about that ever being available to home growers because those companies are also so, uh, sort of proprietary and protective that they would never let it out. But, um, yeah, no, I don't think anything that you'd see in a, in a nursery, whatever, would you ever have to worry about that? There's sometimes neonicotinoids and and things like that that you should watch out for but otherwise it's all good old-fashioned plant breeding that we've been doing since you know we became humans and does anyone know if uh, leaving the water out with the chlorinates that also removes the fluoride in the water since you asked about that yeah i didn't know either sorry we don't know <laughs> all right tim next question please Uh, question for you, Eric, is how do you keep your orchard so sunny when the rest of the area is overcast and cloudy? Is that a Zoom uh, technique? Yeah, it's a special Zoom orchard. That's also, I'm across the country from my orchard right now, so I have to have it behind me to remind me of how, how nice it looked when I left. All right, another pH question. Is there a better type of manure for fruit trees? Chicken manure better than cow? And what about the difference in pH from Shannon? Larry? Larry? Uh, I use, I use any kind of manure. I don't put a vast amount of manure right around my fruit trees. I mix a whole bunch of it in my compost piles and you're mixing so much uh, together, you know, that the individual components don't matter so much. I use a lot of cow manure because 
uh, there's a cattle sale barn close to the house and they're happy for me to load up a, a truckload of cow manure and take it off. So that's what's easily available, you know. I, and I you use, got? oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Susan. Um, I use, I switch it up. I like to switch it up. If I am using uh, rotted manure, I'll do chicken one year, I'll do cow or lamb another year. Um, just because each of them have different, you know, components, some are saltier than others as well. So I'll only use an inch to mulch my tree. I won't put more than an inch of manure. Compost, maybe two inches, but manure, just a little bit. Sam, did you have something you wanted to add on manure? I didn't hear. Oh, uh, yeah, I've always, you know, heard that chicken manure was much hotter, as in like more high, higher in nitrogen. Than other things and often with one of the things we always see at the nursery uh in terms of over fertilizing is people putting you know manure that hasn't composted fully or you know their good old miracle grow and they're like look how beautiful my fruit tree is why isn't it flowering and it's you know too much nitrogen not enough of everything else so just being aware of that okay and oh sam i had one question i wanted to ask you um sure. Uh, maybe to other people too, but definitely for you, because I think that most of the beginners who are watching this episode um, at some point will feel bad because they kill one of their trees. And uh, I know we all start out that way, and Susan Adventure started that way. Um, but you are a professional orchardist, but I assume you have a good story for a tree that you killed when you started out. Can you hear that? Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, I mean, that goes back to that, you know, story I told at the beginning. I, I, I don't know if it was me or somebody went up to another Sam, Sam Bullock, and asked him, you know, because when you're in an established site, you know, especially in the permaculture spots, it's not an orchard necessarily, and it's landscaped and it's beautiful. And they're like, how did you know, like, you know, <laughs> this divine planting? How did you know where to put everything? And he just laughed at him and said, do you know how many plants we've killed? Um, and I came across a quote again recently that was basically like, you're not actually gardening if you're not killing plants. Um, so yeah, and a lot of the stuff we do too, because we've been operating out of Portland and then on the outskirts and boring and whatnot is all sorts of urban plantings and gorilla grafting. And, and we're lucky because we have access to trees, but I think that it just goes to show like if you can propagate your own material, uh, sometimes it hurts more, but at least you didn't like hurts more emotionally, but you, you didn't invest as many uh dollars into that and then you're much more sort of liberated to plant all over the place and plant more freely but um no you certainly learn a lot more from all the plants you kill than the ones that you put in the ground that just took off and you never had to think about them again so larry did you have a dead tree story you wanted to tell at all oh lots of my uh Probably three quarters of everything I've planted has died over the years. But, you know, you plant enough and you learn a few tricks. Uh, you know, uh, plant at the right time and uh, the fall for most of the stuff in the southeast. Uh, you know, don't put a lot of amendments in your hole. Uh, try to get the pH right, things like that. You learn tricks over the years and get a higher success rate. So, so more than half the stuff I've plant now I uh, kind of expect to live you know I don't have a vast amount I've been planting fruit trees for four years I don't have many old trees uh, you know they're mostly younger than that but you just you just keep trying and you learn things over time you know you got to fail to have a success eventually you learn by your failures so. okay Tim back to more questions yeah, we have a couple of questions about kind of beginning basic order orchard questions, which is topical for this group. Of course, Napex is for beginners as well as advanced experts, self-trained or uh, professional. Uh, Ed asks, are there plants that fruit trees would benefit from within the canopy at the edge of the canopy at the is to plant at the drip line or fruit or within the canopy as the tree matures that would benefit the tree chop slash drop and or deep slash medium depth roots. Wow, okay. Um, Susan, did you guys try planting trees at the edge of your drip line, planting plants at your drip line for your trees? 
I'm really strict, actually. Uh, you know, it's a local park, so we have to be concerned about, you know, grass cutters have to be available. But I am very old fashioned in my approach. I want my young fruit trees to get all the nutrition. I want to give them a fighting chance. And our soil is not that great. But I know lots of people do. Um, and so I'd love to hear others' perspectives on that. Okay. Um, Sam? Yeah. Um we are constantly doing that. I mean, we call it cramscaping because we try to plant too much stuff in a small space, maybe. But also, um, especially we do like a lot of the suburban urban folks. So different than the orchardists who are lining it out. And even them, there's a lot of cool stuff to interplant. Um, but people are really trying to not only plant uh, a home orchard often, but sort of a edible landscape so that it still looks like a landscape when you get there. because starting on early on we were planting all these cool edible landscape designs and we we're like look how much fruit we crammed in here but they kind of look bad because they're so deciduous and you know for proper plant spacing so um i i don't think we should go down a list of all the things you can plant because there's plenty of great books like dave jackie's edible forest gardens that just list a million different things um but i usually just try to tell people like don't overthink it if there's sunlight and a prune canopy where light's getting through, uh, the biggest consideration is don't plant things that are going to get so big that they mess up your airflow and crowd your young tree and lead to increased disease pressure um, and all that, or take away too many nutrients or sunlight and all, all those things. But no, there's, I feel like it's a never ending list of things you can do. Just it's a matter of managing the canopy and all that. Yeah, in fact, I'm looking at the schedule here. I see that we'll be addressing this more deeply in the permaculture session tomorrow. So maybe we'll leave them to address that more and go on to the next question, Tim. Well, we do have more amending soil questions. Lauren asked that when amending your soil for trees, you said that not one should one should not amend the planting wall only. If so, do I need to just spread the fertilizer over the entire planting site? Or do I need to fill before application? And can I apply fertilizer in winter? Asked Lauren. Okay, so Larry, I think you were the one that said don't put fertilizer in the planting hole. So what do you say to this? Yeah, people won't do that because it's easy. Uh, don't worry so much about fertilizer. You got to keep in mind fruit trees are perennial plants. You know, uh, a fruit tree will have roots. It's not like an annual plant like corn or tomatoes, you know, it has to produce their crop in one short growing season, you know, something like that. Yes, of course you want to fertilize it. A perennial fruit tree it has roots that extend out 100 yards in all directions, fine, tiny, tiny uh, fine roots going everywhere. And they go deep into the earth and they absorb in nutrients from a wide area and they store those in their woody tissues during the dormant season. So fruit trees just do not have the same uh, fertilizer requirement uh, that uh, annual plants might, you know, we, we like to fertilize because you run the, the feed store, you buy a bag of triple 13, it's only about 15 bucks, and you throw a few handfuls of that around there, and you see an immediate result, you know, you see a flush of growth from your tree, and the grass all around it turns green, so you think you've done something, whereas uh, you don't really want short-term effects, you're in the fruit trees for the long term, uh, and that's why I tell people buy lime instead of fertilizer, and change your pH in your soil and it'll make a far better uh, longer lasting effect on your soil and, and people don't like to do that because fertilizer is cheap and easy it looks like we get quick results whereas lime is just dirt and you got to pay money to, for that dirt and you get it takes labor to put it out and you don't see immediate results but I, I tell everybody buy lime instead of uh, fertilizer fertilizers that's the question I get asked the most, and fertilizer is one of the least important things for fruit trees, especially young ones. Uh, they don't need fertilizer in the in the planting hole. Okay, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that question also asked about winter fertilizing. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So, Susan, I think you had talked about uh, fertilizing trees before they broke dormancy. So do you winter fertilize then? Not at all. So we right before in the late spring, early, uh, sorry, in the late winter, early spring, I give uh, nutrients to my trees with compost or manure. 
but I stop adding compost by midsummer. So what I'm looking for is the trees to go into dormancy. If I'm going to pump them up with nitrogen, they will continue to grow. You'll get little sprouts. And then when the first frost comes, these little sprouts on the trees will freeze, they will break, they will become an entry place for pest and disease problems. So, you know, let them rest over the winter. I don't add anything over the winter. The only thing I do over the winter is late winter, I will do my pruning, depending on what tree it is. Sometimes winter pruning, sometimes summer pruning. Okay, sounds good. Tim, we got time for another couple of questions. Question from Ross. I have a lot of wild pears are growing in my area. I started to dig them up and graft them in the transplant in my orchard. Am I better off ordering rootstock? Okay. Uh, Sam, you talked a lot about rootstock. What do you think? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think a better off is sort of depends on what you're going for. Uh, if, if they're coming up wild and uh, especially if they're coming up wild where you want them to be, and that is ideal. We got wild plums, the invasive hawthorn and stuff all over Portland. And sometimes they'll just be like right where you want it. You can graft it over to a new variety. Um, and if you haven't dug it up and transplant it, uh, you have a whole root system that's intact. You're not really gonna have to water that tree that much um, compared to if you had dug it up. And But yeah, it's totally, uh, and I encourage people too, to think about rootstock, not just as something you can buy, but you know, something you can germinate on your own as seedlings or find and uh, just anything that's really well adapted and resilient. Uh, you just might get a way bigger tree than if you had bought a dwarfing rootstock. So something to keep in mind. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt for another one of my questions I wanna get answered here, which was you guys talked about all this orchard preparation of preparing the site and picking the tree and preparing the soil. Um, when you're planting an orchard, should you uh, do you do any preparation for how to deal with the eventual animals which are all going to come to eat the fruit you planted and you won't get to eat it yourself because they've scarfed it all down um susan i guess yours are in parks so you can't do anything can you well our problem isn't the animals <laughs> our problem is the humans we have uh, a problem with uh, people going through our orchard and picking the apples before they're ripe. It's heartbreaking. It really is. We have problems with people picking entire trees and taking all the fruit away again before it's ripe because we're waiting for. So anyways, I would love to put up some anti-human fencing, but I don't think that's allowed in a public park. Um, other than that, we have squirrels, but really we don't have that many animal problems. Okay, and Larry, how about in your orchard? Do you have to worry about deer a lot? And... Uh, yeah, uh, everything's got to be fenced. Well, I started off planting fruit trees to go in my wildlife plots to nurture deer and turkeys. And that's really how I got interested in the fruit trees. Uh, I was a hunter and uh, that worked. So now that it worked, I can't complain that they'll definitely come there. Yeah, they take everything. Uh, I get that birds and the animals take 95% of my fruit. I let them have it, um, plant a lot, and then you'll be able to get a little bit of it. For my young trees, uh, yeah, we have ex extremely heavy deer pressure here. Um, I fence them with five foot fences. I get a five foot uh, uh, a wide wire and roll it into a big cylinder, and I place those around all the young trees I grow into the bottom limbs get out of a deer's easy reach you know um you cannot beat a physical fence you know i've tried all kind of spray repellents and such not many are very rain fast electric fence works they'll run into it full speed sometimes and uh, knock it down and dis disconnect the current so you can't beat a physical fence uh just live with your wildlife don't worry about it so much you know they're going to get some of it enjoy watching the wildlife you know don't don't worry about it that's the best food they can get in the wild you know what you're growing in your orchard they'll come to you and they'll stay there permanently yes but wildlife's fun to watch okay all right tim um we got time for one more question so go ahead um great questions and answers in the there's a few great commenters and thank you for everyone for your questions and comments this has been really interactive in the q a 
How about a, a question about grafting? Uh, Michael Scott asks, I seem to have a low succession rate and grafting pear scions about 20% as opposed to apples, 90%. I know pear wood is harder than apple. Am I missing something? Um, uh, Sam, you talked more about grafting, so I guess I'll throw you that question. What do you have to say about grafting pears versus apples? Yeah, um, apples are easier for sure because uh, the wood is a lot softer and often the diameter of it is a little bit thinner on apples, so it's less wood that you're actually cutting through. Um, I guess the first thing is just, just keep trying and you'll, you'll get it eventually, but also try different techniques, you know, like a, a cleft graft on it might not work as well as a whip and tongue or a bug graft on it. So it's a fun opportunity or excuse too to try out different techniques and say, man, my, my cleft grafts on pears just aren't working at all. Maybe I should do some bug grafts this summer and learn a new technique. And then you might find that you like that more or it works better for different things. And so try out different techniques and just keep grafting. And Larry, I assume you graft up pear trees and apple trees in your nursery. What do you Yeah, think? I started grafting. I started off with grafting pears. I thought they were easy, even easier than apples. Um, you might have gotten a bad batch of a rootstock or cyan wood, either one. Uh, don't be discouraged because pears normally uh, graft pretty well. Don't go by your experiences on one batch of stuff you got one year. Just keep trying. Grafting's always a percentage game. Nobody ever gets 100%. So uh, be encouraged by your successes. But uh, pairs should graft okay. You know, just keep trying. Susan, do you graft trees in your park? Not successfully yet. I have tried. <laughs> I've, I've, I got to keep trying. Okay. Well, um, I think we're near the end, so let's finish on time. So I'm going to say that thank you all on behalf of NAFEX um, for making this a great session. Once again, the recording of this session will be made available on NAFEX.org webpage um, in about 24 hours. And it will stay there for about a year, and then it'll be transitioned to our NAFEX TV YouTube channel where everyone will be able to view it. Um, there may be other downloadable content now on our webpage about the conference attendees, um, the PowerPoint slides or whatever they made available. Um, and don't miss the other sessions at our virtual conference for the rest of this week. Please stay connected on social media and you'll find all links in our nafix.org homepage.